and welcome back to this, our third video in our series about uh, Black Death, a three pound plastic combat robot. Uh, in this video, we're gonna be going over the chassis and the electronics. Make sure to check out our first two videos if you missed them, the first one being a design overview, and the second one being about the drive system. Uh, because this robot's chassis design uh, is of a laser cut, kind of 2D elements all bolted together, um, it's actually part of a family of robots that I made. So we're gonna take a look at those as well. Uh, this big wooden one here being the first one that I made. This is a uh, machine bot. This is a sumo robot uh, made for Dragon Con uh, in Atlanta. I'll link to those videos. And this robot, which is uh, Yata no Kagami, which is made of Delrin, so it's actually from the same sheet of material. Um, this one's only partially complete, and it's also a sumo robot. It's named after the uh, Imperial Seal of Japan. Uh, you can see kind of how the design evolved, and I'll point out some of the key elements uh, in designing this kind of chassis made out of uh, 2D laser cut material. So let's dive into uh, close-up shots of all the robots. So let's roll right in with Pushinbot. This is the oldest of the three robots and the first one that I built using this uh, kind of 2D uh, plates all bolted together uh, construction technique. I definitely didn't invent it. It was uh, inspired by the robot Nyx, which has been very successful in, uh, in Dragon Con, which this robot was uh, designed for and also by the robot um, Tetanus, which uh, fights oftentimes in, in Motorama and uh, utilizes the main thing that makes this possible, which is nut strip. So this is just very simple uh, aluminum rectangular uh, pieces that have holes tapped alternating on each side. So this little piece here has five holes and it just makes it super easy to, to bolt two um, surfaces at a 90 degree angle. And then all the teeth actually give the majority of the strength um, but the nut strip just keeps it from falling apart. Uh, so getting into the, the inside, you can see that there's these uh, kind of complicated pods here, and we'll get one of these out. This is the drive. Moving slightly further back, we have the battery compartment. So this is a padded compartment, um, which has right now just one of the two batteries that would normally be in there. And uh, then a whole bunch of room in the back for speed controllers. These are um, Vetter electronic speed controllers. So these were originally created for um, electric skateboards. Um, so these are, electronically at least, these are like the, the cream of the crop. They, they give you all the different options you could possibly want. Most importantly for this kind of sumo robot, pushing robot, uh, they give you torque control and current control. Um, so you can make sure that you never exceed a certain current limit, uh, which would burn out the motors. And of course, that, that's a very common failure mode in sumo robots because you're pushing, you're gonna be stalled sometimes where it's a pretty even match. And um, if you allow the motor to persist in that state with, without any kind of current limiting circuitry, it will draw way, way, way more than it can handle. It'll overheat, it'll start burning up. Um, but anyway, so we got two of these and they're just kind of loosely in here. During the actual competition, I just had it all duct taped together. Um, and then we just have some uh, shaft collars holding each side of these wheels on. Uh, a few standoffs holding an exterior plate and uh, a chain that's protected on the inside of that uh, transmitting the torque that's all on the front wheels to also be on the back wheels. Um, looking at it from the side you can see that the wheel is uh, taller than the, the chassis so it's actually able to drive upside down and this was a 30 pound uh, category and this entire uh, wedge plus uh, body only weighs 12 pounds, so there's a 15 pound weight to the added to the back just to let it make full use of the weight class. Uh, on the front, we have these uh, industrial hinges that are spring-loaded that actually held the wedge on, uh, so that would push the wedge into the ground and kind of keep it low. Oh, and before we start taking it apart, we have to explain, of course, why is it, why is it named Pushinbot? I mean, of course, Pushin is very cute, um, but the reason is because it's a sumo robot and it's going to be pushing the other robots off the stage. Beautiful. Okay, so here we've gone through 22 fasteners. So definitely uh, as a first draft design, I filled every single hole in the nut strip. I wanted every piece of nut strip to be fully constrained. So at least two uh, bolts on each side. And when you end up putting sub modules together and so on, you end up with way more fasteners than you need. So here's one of the drive modules, uh, a 50 millimeters by 45 millimeters brushless outrunner motor, uh, 20 to one Bainbot's gearbox, and you can see the construction is very simple. 
uh, just one plate, two plates that bolt on to the uh, gearbox, and then one plate in the back, which holds a bearing, which supports the, uh, the back side of the shaft just to keep this from wobbling around too much. And then two plates on the side that hold everything together, and two pieces of nut strip that allow you to bolt this whole sub-assembly onto the side of the robot. So one other uh, maybe fault of this design, the nice part is that if you just make all the parts symmetrical, you don't have to worry about uh, cutting you know, slight variations and then accidentally cutting the wrong variation and being ending up with a part you can't use. The bad side to that is that anything that actually needs to be aligned, you can put in backwards. So as I've been reassembling this, I put in this uh, drivetrain box backwards. The cord is sticking the wrong way into the outside wall. So I need to take this whole thing and flip it 180 degrees so that that uh, motor lead is sticking back towards the electronics. Next in the progression was Yata no Kagami. This one was actually created, you know, I think more than a year after the wooden one. Um, but also a sumo robot, uh, this time for the three kilogram league, uh, which takes place on a steel sheet so that you can actually use magnets to improve the amount of grip that you get onto the ground. So there's some magnets here. So here we have two more VESCs. These are made by a company called Inertian uh, that makes these modules mainly for skateboarding. They're nice enclosed versions of what uh, you saw in Prashinbot. So this is like the original open source version. Uh, you got the electronics board and then separately a capacitor bank. And here it's all integrated into one uh, module with an aluminum heat sink. So these give a little bit better thermal performance and also much more compact package. Very difficult to fit two of these inside of uh, the form package of this robot. Um, but let's take it a little bit more apart and look at the chassis. So uh, getting in here, you can see the entire bottom of this robot is completely full of gears and motors. On the side, uh, this 5055 motor goes to uh, one gear and then another. This set of gears can be interchanged, so this one's the low gear ratio where the two gears are almost the same size. There's this much torquier, slower version where the uh, pinion gear is much smaller than the spur gear, and then that goes to this set of a second stage of gearing, which then goes to these urethane wheels. Um, on top of that is the electronics plate, which I've removed, um, but you can see that there's a symmetry here where you know this side, half module and that half module are all the same, and additionally, um, it's designed such that you should be able to service this robot um, by removing the shafts from the exterior and popping out any gears or wheels that you need to change without having to take the whole robot apart. Um, so let's just demonstrate that now. Okay, so we've removed this little clip that was holding the shaft in. And now, can see that it can slide right out. We can uh, take out both wheels and the gear. So now looking from the bottom, you can see the reason this robot had to be made out of Delrin. First of all, it's a little bit stronger than wood and more durable, and these robots really push each other quite hard. So I wanted to just have that little factor of safety. And then secondly, these screws here are actually in holes which have been tapped into the Delrin. So um, this allowed me to directly attach these magnets to these threaded holes instead of needing to put a nut on the other side because there's really just no room on the interior of this robot for any kind of nuts to be sticking through. Another interesting feature of Delrin um, that you can't see here is that there are actually some fasteners that are in this plate, um, but they are in countersunk holes so that these two plates can still mate up against each other perfectly flat. Uh, that's something that would be not really possible in wood that's this thickness. Trying to countersink something in wood that's this thin would just cause it to, to fall apart too easily. Okay, finally, we're back to the start of the show, Black Death. Uh, here we have, an, again, the Delrin design. In this case, there are no uh, holes tapped in the Delrin. It's purely just for the uh, integrity that we wanted to use Delrin. Taking it apart, we can see that there are three different sizes of Delrin. Uh, so this is a quarter inch thick. Uh, this more interior piece is an eighth of an inch thick. And then the battery holder, which is the most uh, delicate of all the pieces. It's not easy to see right here, but it's a sixteenth of an inch thick. I mean, really, it's pretty much the same story as all the other ones. There's some slots and holes for the nut strip to hold everything together. So the coolest part is definitely the side plate. So this tells the story of the whole robot. I mean, 
This was the piece that I had to dimension correctly so that everything would fit together. This hole is where the wheel goes. The wheel's a certain radius, but then the motor is sticking up next to the wheel, so this defines how long this section needs to be. But it also defines the width because the battery has to slot in here between the motors. So basically that sets up this triangle, which sets up the overall size of the rest of the robot, with the last variable being um, however much weight I needed to make it up to the weight limit I uh, would put into the weapon and depending on how big the weapon could be, that would have changed the radius the weapon was, which of course would affect, would affect the size of the robot right at the tip. So right now there's just a few millimeters of clearance between the edge of the weapon and the wedge on the robot. Maybe the last cool feature to note is this uh, feature on the side, which is intended to prevent the robot from being able to get stuck you know, if, it was, if there was nothing here, it would be very, very stable to sit on its side. But uh, with this additional piece, it tends to flip back over onto its uh, wheels. And then lastly, of course, it's an invertible design. The wheel is bigger than the, the chassis on both sides by, I think, uh, it's a quarter of an inch proud. Okay, but this side has a nice plate, but this side is naked, and why is that? So I think this is a great time to start talking about the electronics. Let's zoom in a little bit here. So when I was going to test the robot, I had a smaller receiver that actually fit nicely into this compartment and everything would uh, be able to get jammed in here. Um, but that receiver didn't actually work with my transmitter for whatever reason. So I had to take out one of my larger ones from one of my planes, remove the case and kind of just shove it in here as best I could. So this receiver is maybe two or three times as big as the original one. And that basically made everything else a really tight fit. Um, other than that, there are some tiny ESCs um, these are little DC uh, brushed motor drivers from FingerTech, two, one each for each of the motors. Uh, heat tracked into that bun heat shrunk into that bundle, tracked, heat tracked. And then uh, tucked down in this little area uh, between where the battery sits and the end of the robot is a brushless motor controller um, for the weapon motor. So now let's get into the videos of it being built. So here's the actual laser cutting process. This is actually not the first pass. The white dust is kind of the burnt remains of the Delrin, and it usually takes at least three passes, but possibly more depending on the power of your laser and the thickness of your pieces. The goal is to make sure you never see a flame actually start to flare up because that'll start to melt the Delrin in a very nasty way rather than cutting clean lines. Trying to shake off any of the little hole cutouts that are still stuck in the pieces. Some of them are stubborn though and you have to go afterwards and poke them out with a sharp object. Making a little bit of uh, cardboard soft jaws just to keep the red on the nut strip very nice and shiny. using a very fine uh, pitch saw and for cutting metal. Probably don't want to keep your hand under the saw just as a general rule. So I tried to make the battery compartment uh, with special epoxy that was meant to glue plastic together, but it turns out that Delrin is just really hard to glue or paint. Uh, so even after trying to prepare the surfaces, sanding them, all that sort of stuff, using the appropriate epoxy. I gave up on this and just used a piece of tape. So it's the Sunday before the competition and uh, what I didn't want to be doing today was fixing my laptop which won't charge. This has been a recurring problem and I think I've finally found the root cause. So I'm gonna re-solder this connector and put my laptop back together and then hopefully I can start assembling the robot again because I need to get my designs off this because I need to remake some of the parts that don't quite fit together. And now we're just press fitting in all the bearings. Now I'm modifying the speed controller, removing the battery cables and putting them on the opposite direction just because they need to be routed that way inside the robot. Uh, then taking all of the motor connectors and changing them to be sticking out at 90 degrees. Once again, do the limited space. Um, 
then resoldering the capacitor to save me a few more millimeters uh, going from this sideways orientation to up and down on one side of the board. Redoing the RC servo leads so that they're much shorter. Redoing the heat shrink. The first test, driving. So the floor of the arena is made out of metal for this uh, competition. So I put magnets just by the wheels on either side. And to see how effective those are at increasing the downforce, I have the scale here. So the robot doesn't lift off until 1.38 pounds. These are all the parts that are not part of the weapon assembly. So we'll compare this to the CAD and see how close we are and everything else up to 1360 grams can be put into the weapon. Beautiful. Beautiful. Beautiful.